Welcome to this installment of How to Kill Team. I was wondering how I would do this. I figured there would be overlap between the old rules and now. Maybe talk explicitly about the changes. Maybe allow all the videos to breathe on their own. No, I prefer the challenge. And honestly, even though there is still a lot that has rolled over from the prior edition, there is certainly enough to make me want to redo it all. The old rules will be archived, along with the team overviews, as those have a firm place in my heart. But we begin anew, and we have quite the journey ahead of us. So if you are new to this channel and find this information to be helpful and are looking to add more tabletop content to your collection, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and send a prayer to the machine spirit in the form of one of these flavors of thumb, if you want. Come, Greg, it begins again. Much of the structure of Kill Team is intact. Start a turning point, into the strategy phase, firefight, end phase. Detail comes from the nuance, and we can go section by section. Some core ones here, you may find them to be familiar. For instance, rules that occur simultaneously are ordered by the player with initiative for the turn. This will be helpful in situations where both characters can suddenly attack at the same time or if an ability or debuff occurs in about the same situation, the person with initiative will choose the first up for that whole interaction. Tie initiative rolls are given to the player who didn't have initiative in the last turn. No need to re-roll. Why change such solid baselines? However, a new touch. Command points gained are adjusted. One point for each for turn one and then one point for who has initiative and two to the other player after turn one. Finally, all my poor initiative rolling could pay off if I could just pick a good second activation team. Unit orders are set to ready after command point gains. Seems simple, but rules like this are timed in such a way for potential abilities going forward. Strategic gambits are now the all-encompassing term for ploys and certain strategy phase abilities. Gambits are taken in sequence until both players pass. Seems to apply even with units that claim strategic gambits as their abilities. Aquilan troopers' rapid insertion could be played in the first strat phase to cause the troopers to all move. This ability would take up part of the back and forth situation with the opening strategy phase, allowing you to see if your opponent is going to spend some command points without needing to use any of your own. Entering the firefight phase, the player with initiative picks a single unit, determines its order, performs actions in any sequence, and then the operative is considered expended next player activates. If that player is out of activations, but there is still more to go, there is potential for counteract the new Overwatch. More on that in a second. Action economy is about the same. APL determines action points that you can use. Actions come with cost. You can't go over the total points limit. You cannot perform the same actions twice. This is of course by name of the action, although some actions prevent others from occurring. More on that as we go. Action point minimum from cost reduction of different actions is always zero. No trickery based negative cost giving you more for some reason. You don't need to pre-declare all actions taken and if actions are found to be unable to be completed, points aren't lost. Instead, the game state is reset and points are returned to the time just prior to the action attempt. Expended is now the term for not ready. Being expended now provides the option for counteract. This is an out of activation action that can be taken, which should allow a unit to perform any action, including those it has already taken during that turning point. Quite like Overwatch, all operatives have the potential to do this once each turning point, depending on how many enemies are left to activate. Counteract simply allows you to perform a single one action point cost action. The main limits are that the operative must be in engage, and if it is to move, it cannot move more than two inches. This takes precedence over all other rules, which should prevent charge from being four inches. You don't necessarily have to take a counteract action immediately. It's up to you to choose to do so, or to wait until a later activation gap, or to simply do nothing. We'll talk about specific universal actions and their respective segments. But remember, 
free actions still count against the only one action use function. Also keep in mind, actions taken outside of the overall operative's activation aren't restricted by this once per activation concept. These are all kind of the upfront basic rules, core tenets of the game. All of these components are applied to Kill Team's true foundation, its key principles. This will cover terminologies and concepts that will run through every game of Kill Team played, some that have persisted from the prior rule set and some updates. Bases are still super important for positioning. When it comes to moving around, a unit's base can limit where it can go, and most measurements are taken from the base edge. If a gap between buildings is too narrow for a Gellerpox Hulk, it'll have to go over the top. You cannot allow the base to overlap other bases or even be placed outside the kill zone. From the base, a one inch ring is measured for a control range. It has been determined that controlling objectives as well as the old engagement range will all be tied to this one inch distance. In the old system, you would measure from the center of the objective or token to determine control of it. Now the measurement comes from the operative instead. Damage, very straightforward. Operatives have a wound stat, which is the total amount of wounds they have to lose. Damage chips away at this. When that number meets or exceeds zero, that operative is out. Otherwise, there are two states it can be in. Less than full health is wounded. Less than half health is injured. Wounded may trigger other effects exterior to this, but injured reduces the operative's move stat by two inches and weapon hit stats by one. Basic. Dice are referred to in the common games workshop way, standard d6 dice are used. Rules that state multiple dice to be rolled for certain tests or actions can be displayed as 2d6 or 3d6. When d3 is referenced, you simply roll a d6 and separate 1 and 2 to mean 1, 3 and 4 to mean 2, 5 and 6 to mean 3. And some rules will add to this result in the form of a plus x, x being the number added. In a 2d6 plus 1 roll, if both d6 roll 1s, it's still a 3 total. Keep in mind that with dice rolls, Games Workshop tends to stand by the idea of one reroll per dice. That is to say that if a dice is chosen to be rerolled, it cannot be selected once more for another reroll in the same action. Fate has locked it in. As stated before, distances are measured from the base edge of the unit. This ignores overhanging objects. No way to capture a point simply because a really long rifle just happens to be a little bit closer. Two terms to remember when it comes to range, within and wholly within. Within simply means a component of the target must be touched by the maximum distance provided. When measuring two other operatives, only their bases matter for this. Wholly within will require the entirety of a target to be within the range required. Simple terminology differences. Equipment is defined as universal and faction. Depending on game format, you can select an amount to apply to your on-field team. You cannot select more than one of each equipment option per game. Now, this is just the option. You'll notice things like explosive grenades will let you pick two sub-options for the choice. This is still fine and will only take up one equipment slot. Operatives is a term you will see pop up a lot. This is, of course, in reference to the models on the field. Friendly and enemy are terms applied to this to note which side those models fight for. Certain rules target only enemy or friendly, not both. Orders. The mainstay of Kill Team. There are two states of being. Engage and conceal. Engage comes with the benefit of having little to no restrictions on ability use, as well as having access to the counteract function. Conceal prevents shoot and charge actions from being used, but provides the benefit of being untargetable when considered in cover. More on that in the next segment. There are of course rules that circumvent this, but that's on a unit to unit basis. Quick reminder, orders are still chosen at the top of the operative activation. So if a unit is in close quarters with another, you could stay in or switch to conceal and fight as fight is not restricted by conceal. If the operative survives, it can always dive for cover after. There was a big change with this, however. When setting up units, all operatives must be given the conceal order. It is also stated that this can change when activated. There is no limitation on this based on turn, 
which would imply, unless otherwise set as a game rule for maybe an individual mission, that units can now all change their orders in turn one. A big strategic shift. Ploys, specifically strategy ploys, fall under the strategic gambit segment we talked about. We should probably expand on this though. Yes, some units have strategic gambit abilities that can be used in the gambit part of the strategy phase. These don't appear to have a command point cost tied to them. Ploys, on the other hand, all seem to have a baseline of one command point as a cost tied to them. And where strategy ploys are used only in the strategic phase, there are also firefight ploys to be used in the firefight phase. The only universal ploy we seem to have is the classic command reroll, which is considered a firefight ploy. Keep note that every ploy except command reroll can only be used once per turning point. Games Workshop also felt it pertinent, thanks to some prior gray concepts in the last rule set, that they be very clear on when certain rules have odd timings or even override other rules, what should occur in that situation. And this is done in order of importance. If the ability clearly states that it overrides a core rule of some kind or is timed in a specific way, it in fact does so. If not, the online designer commentary might explicitly tell you what to do. If still no, double check the core rules to see if it has something to run with. If still no, if the action or ability in question uses the term cannot, that will take precedence. And finally, if nothing else, the player currently with initiative chooses how the situation plays out. Because gray rules are always expected, even after this grand edit of the old rules. If a roll-off is referred to, it is simply that all players involved must roll a d6 and compare. Ties are rolled again. There are also some minor things referred to in the key principles, like for instance, sometimes abilities are best tracked with tokens, which can be used on the field. Odd that it would need clarification that you can use tokens in this game, but there we go. An operative being considered a valid target is determined mostly by being visible and being not in cover while concealed, but we're about to really dive into that kind of thing, so just wait a minute and we'll go over everything about visibility and cover. Many veterans of Kill Team so far probably have seen most of these core concept parallels and carryovers. Much of what was done here is setting in stone certain terminology as well as establishing a paradigm through which most of the game's rules and abilities can act in a hopefully smooth manner. We'll get into those in a bit. First, we have an old friend. This is a key principle that needs to be covered in its own section, as it tends to be a worthy foe to many. Visibility remains quite simple. If a single line can be drawn from the head of an operative to any part of an enemy, excluding its base, that model is visible. End of a gun barrel, tip of a boot, visible. Hell, bird pet, absolutely very visible. And as always, operatives are visible to themselves. Cover has not changed much. Determining cover is still based on drawing two lines to each side of a target's base from a single point on the attacking model. These are called targeting lines now. If you are able to draw those lines without passing over terrain, you don't have too much to worry about. If it does pass over terrain, this is considered to be intervening, which is a new term, and one of the possibilities is that the unit you are firing at might be considered in cover. This occurs when a piece of intervening terrain, light or heavy, is within the control range that we talked about earlier one inch. Being of course outside of that one inch will prevent the in-cover benefit. However, if that terrain is heavy and outside of that one inch control range, the operative will be obscured. Unlike the prior rule format, this does not mean the operative can't be attacked. The new era of obscuring simply means that the attack made will have its critical hits reduced to normal and that a single normal attack must be discarded a sacrifice to the obscuring gods. And thankfully, it was clarified in the new rules that these lines can be drawn in three dimensions for things like firing from vantage. If any lines drawn to all points of the visible enemy base go unbroken, the terrain is ignored in this action, and as vantage flooring is considered light, 
and all attached heavy terrain to the vantage point is ignored for obscuring purposes, the vantage terrain cannot in of itself break the targeting lines for the operative that's using the vantage point. This ignoring of attached heavy terrain goes both ways as well, but at the very least, operatives on vantage should get cover from the light floor against those below. Now, like before, there are still some finicky bits with this, especially when it comes to obscuring. Please pay close attention. Like before, distances are measured from the point of intersection with terrain. So, depending on angle, the necessary two inches of distance from heavy terrain can cause obscuring at odd times. Firing at this unit at the far end of a wall at this tight of an angle will cause one of the targeting lines to pass through the wall further than two inches from the model. So in this instance, the target is both within an inch of terrain, providing whatever benefits come from being in cover, as well as benefits from being obscured. Now, in the prior rule set, there was this mythical concept of the magic two inches, at which operatives can be distanced from each other to fire freely without the downside of cover or obscuring. In the new rules, it is stated that an attacking operative within two inches of its target will not need to deal with it being in cover. And heavy terrain is ignored within an inch of both operatives, so at two inches, you won't be dealing with obscuring either way. For the most part, as long as operatives are two inches from each other, ranged attacks will most likely need none of these intervening checks as long as they are visible. Again though, view the terms of obscuring and cover as a sort of keyword trigger that are gained based on how the targeting lines fall on intervening terrain. The effects that occur based on if they are active or not is sort of secondary to ensuring the game state. And, as has been revealed, there are rules in place to override these states of being. More on that later. Coming from the old rules and all the work I did, I won't say the new setup is hyper simple. There's still some nuance, which is good for a strategy game, but the changes I feel are truly positive. The new data cards have had a bit of slimming down. Many have noticed the lack of defense stat, the lack of general activation stat, it was kind of stat bloat, and some universal concepts were put into place to avoid it. At the core though, we have APL. APL used to generate action points. Now it is just considered a limit you can build up to with actions taken. Quite like the old rules, effects that alter their stats cannot raise or decrease it by more than one. The move stat is no longer symbols. So hopefully I don't have to get into what six inches means. This stat cannot be reduced to less than four inches, a holdover from a balanced data slate change that occurred very early in Kill Team 2.0's life. The save stat is applied to defense dice, which occur in specific situations. We'll go over one of those in the attacking portion of this overview. Wounds is the total amount of counters that are removed as the unit takes damage in its journey towards injury and death. You don't necessarily need to track these amount of wounds in any certain way, so long as you know the total damage received leading towards this operative's demise. Below the stats, a selection of weapons will appear. These represent what could be on the unit. Team information tends to let you know about loadouts these operatives can take. The bullet symbols are ranged, knives are melee. Attacks will be the amount of dice rolled when using this item in an action. The basic unaltered number you will be looking for in order to hit your target is set as the hit stat. A simplification of ballistic skill and weapon skill. The damage line is split, usually between the normal damage and critical success damage in that order. The actions that use these weapons lay out what is considered a baseline critical success. The area after this is for any special rules that will be applied to the weapon. This can come from a universal pool we will go over, as well as faction and even unit specific rules that tend to be explained either in the team rules or on the unit card. That'll appear in the area below these weapon options, along with any other abilities that come from the unit. Abilities that have a wide array of shifts and changes within the game's core rules, from ignoring dice to performing actions in the strategy phase to special actions that come with a cost that can be performed during the unit's activation. Below this is a selection of keywords. 
Keywords are important when it comes to rules interactions. Some abilities and equipment will explicitly say that it only interacts with certain keywords. Keep these in mind. This is all very similar to the prior rule set format for character information, just with a bit more refinement. The equipment overall has gone through a very big shift. Now, there are categories that equipment falls under team-based and universal. Returning players from the last iteration will find that most teams have had a massive reduction in equipment choices. However, you will find that these choices are applied to the entirety of the team usually, not just individual units. Depending on mode of play, a certain amount of options will be allowed when selecting equipment for the match. For instance, the first approved op season has set this value to four, which can be spent on either team or universal equipment as you see fit, with one restriction. Unless otherwise stated, you cannot pick a single equipment option more than once. Taking a look through the universal side of things, you'll find some returning concepts, along with items that have been placed here due to how common they were, and even some new faces. We'll start with the familiar, two times light barricades, the mainstay of kill team, although considering the other options, we may see less of these. For a single slot, you will get both barricades. These are considered to be light terrain and can be placed before the battle anywhere within your territory and outside of two inches from other equipment features. Your territory is key, as your deployment zone is part of your territory, but your territory will extend past that point usually. This will mean that you have until about the halfway point in the kill zone as your territory most of the time, but the mission briefings will clarify this positioning. These can also only be set up on the kill zone floor. From the new pile, we have one times ammo cache. Again, wholly within your own territory, this item provides all of your friendly operatives with a zero action point cost ability that can potentially be used within limits. Only your operatives can use your ammo cache. The operative using it must be within control range of the ammo cache, so the one inch distance. It considers this ammo cache to have been used for the turning point, and it cannot be activated if the friendly operative is in control range of an enemy operative, if the marker isn't yours, or if it has already been used during that turning point. The benefit provided comes in the form of a single free dice reroll from a shooting attack. As this object does not need to be set up on the kill zone floor, it could be very useful supporting a concealed sniper on a vantage point. One times razor wire is a single piece of exposed and obstructing terrain that is set up wholly within your territory, two inches away from other equipment, as well as only on the kill zone floor, quite like the barricades. Exposed is the universal terrain term that implies it can't break targeting lines, but obstructing is unique to the razor wire and provides a debuff to all operatives, friend or foe, that pass within one inch of it in the form of a two inch reduction to the total move. Something interesting comes from the climbing rule we'll go over later. The short of it is if a unit needs to pass over top of the razor wire, it should cost a total of four inches off the total move unless the operative has some mobility benefit. Now again, the move stat can't be reduced to below four inches, but this is actually shaving off the move itself, not the stat. It could be a solid way to just absolutely shut down a narrow hallway. Two times ladders is a bit of a shift from the usual defensive and movement restricting elements of the equipment. These actually try and help the slower teams traverse highly vertical maps. Placement restrictions will keep them in your territory, two inches from other equipment, one inch away from doors and access points, and they must be placed against terrain that stands at least two inches tall. Their benefit comes in the form of reducing vertical movement cost. Over the full height of the ladder, a climb would be considered one inch, 
The ladder itself is four inches tall, a pretty good deal for the more landlocked teams. And a benefit to the ladder is that an operative can move through it as though it's not there. You can't end a move in its place, but if you're climbing up over a two inch wall, the extra two inches of the ladder won't interact with the operative that wants to get onto a surface. They are also considered exposed terrain, so you won't get any cover from them. Many of these beneficial pieces of terrain do not allow enemies to use them. Ladders, however, are a little more communal. The one times comms device is wholly set up in your territory as well, but seems to be very specific in its action. Some operatives will come with abilities marked as support. These abilities may have an attached range in which they can work. This comms device, when within the control distance of the supporting operative, will increase the distance by three inches. Opponents' comms devices will not help your allied units, quite like the ammo cache. Next up, one times mines is another allied territory deployable, but with a slightly different limit. It could be set up on vantage points, but it cannot be set up within two inches of any other markers or access points. This would include things like objective markers or perhaps mission specific functional markers, as well as most doors, including doors you'll see in the Gallo Dark. The mines trigger when an operative passes within control range of it, friend or foe. The marker is removed and D3 plus three damage is dealt to that operative. Brutal. Beyond the standard barricades we know and love, there are two new additions to the list of cover options. You can take a one times heavy barricade if you like. This will be limited to deploying within two inches of your team's deployment zone specifically, not territory, but it is considered to be a heavy piece of terrain for obscuring purposes and anything else that comes from the heavy concept. As well, don't forget, it can only be set up on the kill zone floor. If you prefer, you could take a single portable barricade. This can be placed in the normal kill zone floor wholly within territory structure, and it is on a basic level considered to be light. It also brings the protective and portable rules unique to its existence. Protective simply means that if an operative is in cover with this piece of terrain, its save stat can be increased by one to a maximum of two plus. Portable means that the operative can only be considered in cover if its base is connected to both feet on the barricade model and the terrain is considered intervening for the attack. This is a bit restrictive, but it should prevent two models from being considered to have an increased save stat. While this operative is considered connected to this terrain, it can perform a one point action. This is considered to be the same as reposition, but with a two inch reduction to the total move and climbing, dropping and jumping cannot be performed. At the start of the action, the barricade is removed from the kill zone and after the model moves, it can set the barricade up again in any facing as long as it is connected to it. This action is fully considered to be repositioned, so any and all restrictions that come from that ability use will still apply. What's interesting here is how this rule may apply in situations where the operative dies while performing the barricade move. Changes to the state of the character being on the field are usually applied after completing an action. This is referenced as the unit being incapacitated and then removed. You'll see this mostly from the fight ability we'll go over. As far as I can tell, if an operative moves within one inch of the minefield during this action and the damage kills it, the full move would still finish. The barricade would be placed and then the operative would be removed from battle as the stat change would hit. This may need some clarification down the road. Lastly, on the equipment list, we have two different grenade options. Both choices provide you with two sub options. For each of the overarching equipment picks, you can choose two sub options. Both can be the same or they can be different. For instance, if you take the utility grenade option, you'll have stun and smoke grenades as sub options. I could then choose to go with two smoke or two stun or one smoke and one stun. Simple. These choices sort of stand apart from your team. For instance, if I choose the double smoke option, over the course of the game, I can use at most two smoke grenades. These can come from any operative I so choose. The utility grenades themselves apply a one action point ability that can be used once per game per chosen grenade type. But rather than applying this to a single unit as before, 
anyone in the whole team could potentially use this ability to burn the single choice. If they use the smoke grenade, a token is placed on the field within six inches of the operative using the ability. The token must be visible to the operative, so no over the wall shenanigans. This marker is considered to create a one inch area around it of unlimitedly tall smoke. If placed on vantage, this smoke will not go below it. While an operative is wholly within the smoke, it is considered to be obscured by operatives more than two inches from it and vice versa. And unless an operative that is shooting into the smoke is within two inches, piercing is ignored as a weapon rule. Mercifully, as the turning points roll over, this smoke will persist on the field for D3 operative activations. This will hopefully give your unit some time to take action if they need to. If the turning point somehow ends before this D3, the smoke will disappear regardless. The stun grenade allows your unit to select a visible enemy operative within six inches to be the target. Remember that visible simply means you can see part of the model. Unit order and cover won't really help here. That operative and all other operatives, friend or foe, within an inch of it must take a stun test. A single D6 is rolled for each, and on 3+, plus, one APL will be reduced from their stat until the end of their next activation. Both the smoke and stun actions cannot be taken within control range of an enemy or if there are no instances of smoke grenades or stun grenades ready to be used, of course. Smoke and stun grenades weren't the most common in the prior kill team rules, but there were several teams that had some form of access to these. Now that all teams can use them, there should be some fun combinations going forward, as well as some solid reason to take anti-obscuring ranged units. From the explosive grenade section, you have two options to pick from in a similar fashion to the utility nades. You could take a frag and a crack, two frag, two crack, pick your poison. Each will be considered a ranged attack that any of your units can have access to up to the total amount of times you have taken them for your team over the course of the whole game. So again, choosing double frag would allow at most two frag grenades to be used in the shooting action over the course of the whole game. Stats wise, the frag grenade is still great for low health hordes. Four attacks, hitting on fours, two four damage line, a range of six inches, a blast range of two inches from the initial target, and the saturate keyword. We'll go over these terms again in the weapon rules section, but for now, saturate prevents enemies from retaining cover saves. Sometimes there's a sub version to this rule, but just know that if it simply says saturate, no type of cover can allow that unit to retain a save. Crack grenades have a similar four attacks hitting on fours, but with a four five damage line. Range six with piercing one and saturate. Again, we'll repeat this later, but piercing is a sort of catch all for armor reduction. This version on the crack grenade means that one defense dice is removed without need for a trigger effect. Returning players may have noticed something. There are no rules similar to indirect attached to these. So concealed in cover units will still have some solid protections. The trick comes with how blast works now. If the initial target of a blast weapon has any of the obscuring or in cover benefits, all subsequent targets will gain them. Units in conceal that are taking subsequent blast attacks won't be considered in conceal for purposes of being valid targets. We'll touch on that again later. But these are all the new selections of universal equipment accessible to all teams. Many great options here, and there are some truly horrifying combos that come to mind with some of the current operatives I am aware of. And again, team equipment can be chosen in place of any of these universal items, but we'll have to go over those in specific team overview videos. An operative's activation in Kill Team will have it using actions up to the capacity of its APL. This is basically much the same as the old rules with only a couple minor tweaks. For instance, move is now referred to as reposition. At the value of one action point, an operative using the action can move a total distance up to the full or augmented value of its move stat. The operative cannot move within control range of enemies, as well, it must move in full increments over the course of its action. If it takes an inch and a half to get past a corner and move in another direction, that will cost a full two inches regardless of where you stop. Terrain will interact with this as well as all movement abilities, but we'll talk about that in a whole other section. 
Note that reposition cannot be used if your operative is within control range of an enemy. As well, fall back and charge will prevent this action if they have already been used. Dash is yet another single action point in value and has similar basic requirements to reposition involving enemy control ranges, but instead of using the move stat for the operative, you can instead make a three inch maneuver. The move will not allow climb, but drop and jump are viable. And the only action that will prevent dash from being used is charge. Fallback is an action that costs up to two action points. All rules are similar to reposition again, including using the operative's move stat, but this maneuver can be taken only while within an enemy's control range, and it will allow the operative to move within other enemy control ranges, as long as its final destination is outside of those ranges. If the unit charged or repositioned already in the activation, it cannot perform this action. Last on the universal movement list is charge. Single action point value. Reposition basic rules apply. Augments to that ability include adding two inches to the total move stat. It must finish the move within control range of an enemy operative. And during that move, if it passes within enemy control range of an operative that doesn't have a distraction in the form of an allied unit keeping it occupied, it must stop there. If reposition, dash, or fallback were used prior to wanting to charge, this action cannot be taken. These are all the flat mobility actions that exist in Kill Team. All of them are adjusted by terrain rules involving things like climb and drop, but again, that will be later. Take note that some rules for certain teams may allow these to be used at a reduced cost. Even when free, the actions are still taken. No double dashing with the Corsairs in the same activation. However, with the new counteract rule, an operative can dash in its activation and once again as a counteract between opponent activations, as this is a separate situation. Movement is great and all, but we want to roll dice and deal damage, and there are two universal ways of doing this, shooting and fighting. If you skipped the vision, cover, and obscuring section, maybe roll on back there. It will be important for shooting. The shoot action costs one action point and can only be done by models in engage, unless other rules change this, and normally an operative is unable to perform this action while within the control range of an enemy. When you undergo the full process of this, step one is to select a ranged weapon, normally marked with the bullet symbol. Next, you select a valid target. First check is that the target enemy operative is visible, drawing the line from the head to any component on the model, not the base. Step two is to ensure that the target operative is not both in cover and in conceal, which would normally cause them to be no longer valid. There are, of course, ways around this, like with Vantage against Light Cover and Conceal, or even some other unique abilities. And remember, if the target is within two inches, it cannot be in cover. It may be good to check for intervening heavy terrain at this point, to check for obscuring if it will adjust to the upcoming rolls. As well, the target cannot be within the control range of a friendly operative. After the target verification, we roll dice! Roll an amount of attacks equal to the attack stat on the weapon chosen, along with any initial modifiers. And remember, if the target does get the benefit of obscuring, crits are retained as normal, and one dice must be sacrificed. A common rule of thumb with all attacks and defense dice is that rolls of one always fail, rolls of six always critically succeed outside of the obscuring thing we just talked about. Even this rule can be messed with a little, but in general, keep that in mind. Your opponent gets three dice according to the shoot action. Modifiers may occur in the form of piercing or other possible sources. If the benefit of cover is conferred to the target operative, they can choose to retain one of these dice as a normal success before rolling. Otherwise, all dice are rolled and the results are compared to the target operative's save stat. After finishing all these rolls and rerolls, which by the way, the attacker should go through all rolls and rerolls before even seeing the opponent's defense dice roll out. The defender gets to choose how the results play out based on some simple concepts that have persisted from the old rules. A single normal save can prevent damage from a single normal attack. Two normal saves can block a critical attack. One critical save can block a critical attack or normal attack. 
after lining up how this plays out, all remaining unblocked damage dice convert to damage based on the type of roll and damage line on the weapon, and then it is applied to the target. There's a bit of distinction made at the end of this, as well as fight, which we'll go over. If the target wounds are all expended, it is considered incapacitated until the shoot action is considered complete, at which point it will then be removed. This is mostly pedantic for certain abilities and functions that could occur when a unit is incapacitated before it is removed, like performing a mission action, or shooting or fighting before the removal, or possibly placing a token. The other attack action, fight, is very similar to shoot, just close range. One action point required, but the only viable targets for this must be within the operative's control range. The weapon selected will have a knife symbol attached, the blessed symbol of the stabby stab. The target operative also gets to pick a melee weapon, as this action is a little more back and forth. Both players roll the full amount of d6s their weapons provide, past any modifiers, retain dice that meet the weapon's hit stat, and still, ones always fail, sixes always crit with the standard footnote of unless otherwise stated. A couple things here. One, operatives locked into a fight action can gain bonuses to their hit stat by every friendly operative also within control range of their enemy target so long as there isn't another enemy within that operative's control range to occupy them. Basically, if this legionary has a friend in close with this Corsair, it would be hitting at one better than normal, but if its friend happened to have another Corsair near it, this bonus will be prevented. Positioning in combat can be key, as the control range might find some targets are too close or too far to gain this benefit. Two. When re-rolling in this step, the current player with initiative, that is to say the one who has the initiative for the overall turning point, not necessarily this one action, gets to choose to re-roll or pass. The other player can then choose to re-roll or pass, and if both players pass in sequence, no more re-rolls can be made. After all dice are set, we start a sort of rock-paper-scissors game, starting with the player that initiated the fight's action, Unless the target has some shenanigans, a single dice is selected and used to either cause damage based on if it is a normal or critical, as well as trigger any effects it would cause for either hitting or blocking. Then the target player will get to choose one of their unused unblocked dice in a similar fashion. Unlike shooting, for the most part normal dice can only block normals and crits can block either crits or normals. No two for one here. And as an added trick, even if the opponent is out of dice to block, you can still use dice as a block that you have left. That way you can stall the combat until a more opportune time. However, if a player goes for the kill, Note that upon incapacitation, the action stops. The rest of the dice are discarded and the action ends, allowing the model to be removed unless some ability stops it upon incapacitation, like a Felgor Frenzy or something. Both these damage methods are almost full copies from the prior rules. Any shifts seem to mostly exist to clarify when certain things can occur, as well as applying rulings that existed only in the FAQ for the most part. With movement abilities and attacking abilities out of the way, let's take a look at some universal mission actions that I consider to be a positive shift. It might not seem like much, but historically Kill Team's old pickup mission action was a little abusable. What few missions existed that called for an operative to pick up and keep a token ended up simply causing for a chain of actions that seemed almost middle school playground-ish. We still have pickup marker as a one point action. Your unit will need to be in control of the marker and not within control range of an enemy to perform this. After performing this action, the marker will be considered carried, controlled, and contested by the operative. These will be terms related to scoring. Now, for highly mobile teams, this would cause a unit to pick up the marker and flee over to the safety of an allied unit and then, without an action point left, drop it at the feet of that unit for the next activation. This was even more heinous with two GA teams where the next operative would immediately activate, pick up the marker, and sprint into the safety of your deployment zone. 
but the balance has shifted. Place marker is now an action that costs one point to use and cannot be performed if they have already used pick up marker in that activation, unless they meet an untimely end shortly after. The operative selects a single marker it is carrying and puts it anywhere within its control range. There is also a built-in function for this that claims if an operative with any markers is incapacitated, it must perform the place marker action for zero action points. And they are very clear that this will occur regardless of any potential other rules. The incapacitation part is important as we have said that incapacitated and removed are two different stages that occur in sequence. Now again, this might seem like a minor shift to many, but in the new intel mission, operatives will have to pay actions to create carryable intel from the objectives. In the prior rules, with a bit of luck, that team might get first activation. If there was a cultist operative close to the intel, it could activate and with its two action points and two GA function, it could pick up the intel, move six inches to a nearby cultist, drop for free, and when that cultist then activates, it could go into conceal, pick up the intel, and move another six. Just absolute insanity. This adjustment will hopefully bring balance to this situation as it feels like that prior chain of action is what led to the approved ops of competitive to walk away from the pickup actions a bit. And when it comes to missions, many will have unique actions tied to them. Be sure to read them thoroughly and remember some of the key elements in this, specifically operative control range as that seems to be one of the biggest parts in the equation. Universal weapon rules, much simplification, many meta shifts. From the revealed rules for the different factions, many units are getting massive lethality overhauls as well. We have a bit to go over, so let's start with accurate. Accurate will usually be followed by a number, and this number represents an amount of dice that can be retained as normal hits without the need for rolling. An ability that was once tied to specific factions, it is now free for many to use. Vantage will actually provide this rule to those that prefer higher positioning. And if a weapon is receiving benefit from two different instances of accurate, that player can instead choose to use accurate two as a flat override, as both other instances separately would not be used together normally. A good way to make an accurate one weapon retain two dice from Vantage, while not being absolutely broken with an accurate two weapon being fired from the same location. Balanced makes a return and still persists as a single dice reroll for an attack action made with the weapon, cheaper than a command point. Blast X makes a return with a slight change in balance. X still stands for the distance at which the rule will take effect. The primary target of this will have the distance measured from its base edge to all nearby operatives, friend or foe, and attacks will be made to all of them in any order. Key things to note, the original target will of course be limited by whether or not it is a valid target to the attacking operative. All subsequent operatives will only be based on visibility to that initial target, as conceal orders won't matter, even if the blast distance is 3 and the unit is at maximum range. However, the new balance is that if the original target gained the benefit of cover or obscuring, all subsequent targets will have this as well. This seems to be written in a way where those benefits will only come if the original target has them. This is probably one of the first major gray writing moments in the new rules. Not bad so far. Also, Blast used to prevent Overwatch if it was on a weapon's profile, as Overwatch is now counteract and is simply a way to use a single action point action without much restriction outside of movement, Blast is now free to be used out of sequence in this way. Brutal is much the same. Attacks made with this weapon can only be blocked with critical successes. Why fix something that isn't broken? Ceaseless got a bit of a shift. Originally, only allowing rerolls of one, this will now allow the attacker to pick a single dice result number and reroll all of those. Quick reminder that the dice being chosen doesn't need to be failures. If an attack hits on three and can somehow crit on four, and you rolled all threes, it might be valid as an option to fish for some four pluses, get some more crits. 
Devastating X is the replacement for Mortal Wounds X of old. Every retained critical success will now immediately trigger damage in the total amount of what the X is set at. A bit of a shift does come from the lack of a splash rule in the new glossary. Now, if Devastating has a distance applied to it, that distance is a range in which all operatives, friend or foe, including the original target, will receive extra wounds based on the number applied to the Devastating rule. This only requires the dice to be retained to trigger the damage. So this will happen before any defense dice are thrown in ranged combat, and this also doesn't mean the dice are spent on this damage. They will persist to be used for whatever action they were rolled for. Heavy implied that a weapon could not be used if the operative performed any move action other than a dash. On a baseline now, Heavy will prevent all movement in a round where the weapon was shot and all shooting with the weapon in a round where it moved. If heavy has a term after it, usually the dash action is referenced here, then the weapon can be fired after a dash action or a dash can occur after shooting. They also clarify that the guard action predominantly in close quarters is not affected by this limit. Hot, the bane of all plasma users, is back in action but it's had a bit of a shift. Instead of taking damage on all retained ones, which was brutal, a single dice will be rolled after the action is used. If that dice is rolled to be less than the weapon's hit stat, you will inflict damage on that unit as double the result of the dice roll. Two plus on that legionary gunner, four damage received. In situations involving multiple different shoot actions that occur, like from the blast roll, there will still only be one d6 rolled. You can hear the plasma cannon wielding inquisitorial agents rejoicing. Reminder, this will make firing hot profile weapons more dangerous after a unit is injured, which seems very flavorful. Dropping that hit stat by one could cause way more damage if you plan to use the hot profile. Lethal X is pretty much the same as it was before. The X will be the new dice limit for being considered a critical retention. Lethal 5+, plus, dice rolls of 5 or more will be crits. Simple. Limited X makes a return as well, but the X implies a slight difference. Limited simply meant one use per game, but with the addition of the X, there can now be gear with a couple more uses before being fully expended. Piercing X is the new catch-all term for armor pen. In its basic form of piercing X, the X will be the amount of defense dice that are prevented from being rolled. If the term is piercing crits X, the reduced defense dice will only occur if there is one critical hit retained. So both the old APX and PX rules rolled into one. Punishing allows an attack roll that retains at least one critical hit to upgrade a single miss to a normal hit. Not unlike accurate, this rule used to be very limited to specific factions and even ploys. Interesting to see it being considered more universal. Range X is the classic limit to a ranged attack, X being the distance measured between operatives' bases to determine if the attack can even be made. This distance can be measured three-dimensionally for units on vantage points. Good to see that most pistols have had an increase to about eight inches. Relentless, the old beast of a weapon rule. All dice from an attack this weapon performs can be re-rolled. Hits or misses, doesn't matter. Rending allows you to upgrade a normal hit to a crit, so long as a critical has already been retained. Reminder that this is very singular in action. Rolling two crits and two hits does not allow for both hits to be upgraded, only one. Saturate is the new no cover rule, which is Good as the old term brought some confusion to new people when it came to target validity. Saturate simply prevents defense dice from being retained from the benefit of cover. Seek is the new replacement for indirect, and it allows for the rule to be a little more flexible in the balance. Seek at its core will prevent enemy targets from using cover when being picked as a valid target. This will not prevent cover saves, that is what saturate is for it will simply override the cover needed by a conceal order to prevent being attacked. The flexibility of the Seek rule comes from sub-terminology. Seek Light will only allow this overall rule to work if the cover an operative is using is being received from light terrain. Heavy terrain will still prevent targeting. 
Indirect was never this flexible, as it would just universally override cover all the time. Severe is another normally faction limited rule that more units will see going forward. It allows the attacks rolled to upgrade a normal hit to a crit if no criticals were rolled. Horrendous when you're looking for some almost guaranteed damage spiking. Shock is the new melee stun. It's pretty much the specific section of the old stun rule meant for melee stripped out and adjusted. This ability will trigger the first time a critical success is used in an attack sequence. It will allow the operative to discard a single dice from the opponent's pool of successful dice. Specifically, they will be able to remove a retained normal success. If, when using this ability, there are currently no normal dice retained, but there are some critical successes, you could discard one of those. Again, only if there are no normal options. It's okay. I really was hoping this wouldn't be limited to the opening critical only, but I guess this should be a bit more balanced in the hands of a lethal 4 plus shocking Wormblade Talon. Silent returns and is much the same. A weapon with this ability can be fired from conceal. Powerful in the hands of a sniper on vantage, but the trade-off comes from not being able to counteract later with this weapon due to the conceal order being active. We did just go over the element that got split off from the old stun, but the stun ability is still around. And in this instance, if a critical success attack is retained, the target will be hit with a single APL reduction to its stats until the end of its next activation. Torrent X is quite possibly the biggest shift for AoE style weapons. You may have noticed that Fusilade is nowhere to be found on this list. That is because Torrent X will be taking its place by finding a middle ground between Fusilade and Torrent. The X in this instance will be a measurement of distance. In the full sequence of the ranged weapon's use, you will select a primary target and then any other targets within that measurement around them that are also valid targets to the attacking operative. Attacks can be made in any order for all selected operatives. A couple things. One, this makes Torrent the new safer version of Blast, as you can have allied targets within its range and simply not choose them. Two, those targets must be valid in the first place. So if you're seeking protection against AoE weapons like this, Charging an enemy and staying in close to them without fighting is a pretty solid way of preventing this kind of damage. On top of all this, from what I can tell offhand, these attack rolls will still be under the same action. So, any operative that are killed in the process should still be on the field until the end. So, any area benefits will persist between all the attacks before all operatives are removed. Something to keep track of. And with all this said, the universal weapon abilities are complete. Now, these aren't the only abilities weapons will have. Some units and even factions will have rules specific to them that can be applied to weapons they carry. It might be important to ask when going against a team you are unfamiliar with if there are any weapon rules you may need to know beyond the norm. Terrain rules and movement interactions with terrain is a major element in Kill Team. Terrain can both positively and negatively affect operatives in massive ways, so it is key to know how they alter actions being taken. We'll start with the movement adjustments. As stated, using a move action allows the operative to gain the full distance of its stat to use as they need, but if terrain stands in their way, those inches can be spent as cost to change the operative's elevation. Climbing is one of these adjustments. If ever your model must pass over a piece of terrain, barring any special rules that could apply, vertical measurements must be taken of the terrain that is being climbed. The distance to a minimum of two inches is considered the cost to climb the terrain. That climb can only begin if the operative makes it to within one inch horizontally and three inches vertically to climb. A few movement options have been shaved out of the pool from the prior rules. This includes Traverse. Traverse used to cost a flat two inches to pass over terrain. Now, without that function, climb costing two inches base will act in a way like Traverse without the need for it, specifically because of how drop works. 
Dropping is a cost and distance to go from above the kill zone down to a surface below. This can occur after moving off the terrain or jumping, which we'll get into in a minute. It looks like this. In the case of the barricade, this intercessor has decided to use its six inch move to pass over top. Despite being under two inches tall, the cost of the climb would remove two inches. So from this position, the base can be moved four inches. Since the drop is under two inches, it is negated by the ignored two inches still allowing for the four inch in total to be considered for the move. A minor detail here is that the two inch ignore is in total for all drops done. If at first you drop one inch and then two inches later in the move, it will still cost a leftover one inch. Jumping is the last movement interaction that can occur here. Mercifully, there is no test to take for this anymore. That was changed a while ago. All that matters is that when moving from one piece of terrain to another, there can be a four inch gap horizontally, as well as a one inch difference of height that can be ignored. If the wall has a rampart, this is now included in this move. If you must climb a wall before jumping, it must occur. This rampart component is applied all over as well. Climbing this housing in total would cost a bit much and as far as rules apply, unlike this last iteration of Kill Team, it does not appear that dash can be added to the total move to allow this to occur. The new system can be a bit more limited due to this, but also a bit more clear. The terrain itself that you will be maneuvering around comes with several attached concepts that are woven into almost all aspects of the game. Heavy terrain makes a return and in much the same way can provide operatives within an inch of it cover and for operatives outside of an inch, a chance at being obscured depending on targeting lines we went over already. Light terrain can only convert cover to nearby operatives, not so much the obscuring. I feel it is important to note here that unlike in prior rules where allies could confer cover to each other, that does not appear to be the case anymore. The allied unit can be considered intervening, but without an attached rule like the Navi Endurance Breach Wall, they will still be a valid target and unable to gain a cover save, which feels more proper. Blocking references gaps in cover that can't be used when trying to determine visibility for cover or obscuring. The gaps would continue to be considered intervening, like the space below a pipe, a small window and doors, things like that. Vantage terrain has had a massive overhaul with big meta implications. Only areas above the kill zone that are considered vantage can be used by operatives to end a move on and the terrain is now considered light, which means operatives standing on Vantage will most likely gain cover against operatives below. Based on the Vantage height compared to the target being attacked, the accurate weapon rule will be conferred to the action. This will only work against operatives in Engage. If the operative is two inches higher than the target, they will be provided an accurate one rule. Four inches or more will provide accurate two one or two auto-retained attacks could be useful. And attacking operatives on Vantage still gain the benefit of overriding light terrain for operatives in Conceal Below when it comes to targeting. It's weird that they didn't just say seek light here, but they were very explicit that this is how it works. Cover saves can still occur here, and this will actually be improved for targets and cover below. The target unit can upgrade that retained save to a crit, or they can choose to retain two regular saves instead. The light terrain rule, the accurate rule, easier targeting of concealed operatives, better save retention to operatives below. This is a massive shift. Take note though, that the heavy terrain attached to the vantage cannot confer obscuring to either the targets of the on vantage operative or in reverse. Heavy ramparts can still be considered cover, but Vantage needs at least a slight detriment to keep it in line. Accessible as a trait can be assigned to areas a model can pass through, like a closed door on a wall or a hatch in a ceiling. This terrain is still for all purposes closed when drawing targeting lines, but if an operative wants to pass through that area, it can. The center of the operative's base must pass within the area determined to be accessible, and there is a movement tax of one inch to allow this to occur. Insignificant is a rule applied to terrain that, when moving, will have no effect on the climbing or dropping portion of the rules, like a small pile of rubble or some boxes. There is no need to pay a two inch climb to move over it. Exposed terrain is 
not taken into account with targeting lines, like a ladder hanging off a catwalk. Even if the catwalk is mostly heavy, the ladder can be marked as exposed, preventing cover or obscuring. Much of this terrain list feels like a holdover from the last rule set. It was really only adjusted slightly to match the new move rules, and these functions are applied throughout many of the current arenas Kill Team has to offer. We are now at the start of the new rules up to four total potential kill zones. Open maps are now considered non-specific kill zones. These will mostly show where to place some objectives and allow you the ability to place terrain as you see fit and determine their specific rules from the list we just went over. With the release of Hivestorm, Vulcus was added as a sort of enhanced open map. All components for this are explicitly laid out. The stronghold terrain, large ruins, small ruins, heavy and light rubble, all clearly defined. Which parts are vantage, what's heavy, when there are accessible components, exposed, blocking. The fact that doors and parts less than two inches are ignored for control range visibility. The fact that barred windows have a special rule preventing vision to and from that specific component unless there is someone within an inch of it. When looking up missions for Vulcus, this terrain will be placed in very defined ways, very competitive in nature, like what we saw with Beta Decima and the Gallo Dark. Special rules that only apply to Vulcus arenas, unless your local club wants to use them in other ways, fall under the city fight rules. Like Condensed Stronghold, if a target of a ranged attack is wholly within stronghold terrain on the kill zone floor, and the attack involves the blast, torrent, or the version of devastating that causes an area of wounds, that attack gains lethal five, similar to how the Gallo Dark used to work as well as still kinda does, but only in specific sections of the map. Units within this stronghold terrain feature also gain the ability to, when retaliating in close quarters against an operative that initiated the fight but is outside of the terrain, choose the first of their dice to act in the fight. Like the strike first of old, there is an action that can occur in this kill zone called door fight. It costs a single point and allows for the active operative to fight, and it can select an enemy within two inches of it so long as it is on the other side of a part of the terrain marked as a door. This will be treated as a fight action, which will prevent any possible further fights unless you have a fight twice function and it treats both operatives as being in control range of each other. Overall, Vulcus feels like a welcome addition to the arenas of Kill Team, potentially more condensed with more positives and negatives tied to positioning than normal. One of the returning arenas, and one of my personal favorites, is the Gallo Dark. Close quarters, door kicking, narrow hallways, what's not to love? Most of the rules still persist as we know them and are simply translated to the new cover and obscuring setup which should have many rejoicing at the loss of pure non-reciprocal shooting. Walls are still heavy terrain that cannot be moved over or through in any way by any rules. Impenetrable. Visibility is unable to be drawn through them. Other than areas of the kill zone, like the center or areas marked by certain missions, you cannot measure any distances through walls. You can only measure the shortest route. An example of this would be the Vox Breaker's 8-inch aura of no obscuring. It is not that the aura is restricted to something like line of sight. If the unit is near an open door, you would measure distance to the corner of the door and then measure from that corner into the room to see if anyone is affected. The walls can also only confer cover and obscuring if the target's lines are drawn past a genuine corner, not just these support struts along the walls. The slight protrusion into the hallway isn't enough to protect anyone. This support strut cover override also occurs if the attacking operative has moved past the continued wall line. Basically, if you imagine the wall continuing forward from where it stops as an imaginary line, crossing that will expose all enemies down the alley. Hatchways make a return in all their glory. They can exist in two states, closed and opened. Operatives can perform a mission action called Operate Hatch in order to change the current state of the door. This action can be taken during a dash or reposition action, allowing the operative to rush through or past a door while opening it without losing any movement, unless opening that door manages to put it in the control range of another operative, immediately stopping the move in its tracks. 
Restrictions to this involve the hatch needing to be in the control range of the operative for the action to occur. As well, the operative cannot be in control range of an enemy. And if the door is in control range of other enemies while open, the action cannot be taken. Reminder, since this action does not state it can be taken multiple times during a single activation, three APL units won't gain the benefit of opening the door, shooting, and then closing it. You'll have to activate a whole other unit for that combo. In the closed state, the hatch is simply considered a wall and has all the same benefits. When open, the hatch must be set to its furthest position along its hinge, and that component will retain the wall rule with the area beneath it considered to be blocking for targeting lines. The opened passageway is now considered accessible, insignificant, and exposed. This involves the area immediately above and below the open hatch shape. The areas to the side will still be considered walls for any cover or obscuring benefits. Take note that when opening the door, if there is an operative blocking it from being fully opened, they are to be removed from the kill zone and replaced as close as possible to their original location with the door open. Remember that the accessible trait of the open hatch area means that as long as the center of the base would pass through it, the move can be made at the cost of one inch. This should not mean that paying the inch allows the unit to sort of get picked up and placed on the other side, simply that the resulting move distance would still need to allow the base to be fully set on the other side of the wall for the whole maneuver to be complete. Much like the condensed terrain of the new arena, the Gallo Dark also confers the benefit of Lethal 5 Plus to weapons that involve Blast, Torrent, or the Area Effect version of Devastating. This will be everywhere, not simply in specific spots. For returning players, take note that there is no longer a limit on range for weapons that could be considered indirect, or in this case, seek. There is now greater lethality in these darkened halls. And guess what? The guard action in Gallo Dark persists. It is a one action point shoot action, so unless you can shoot twice per activation, this cannot extend your damage. The operative must also not be in conceal or in control range of an enemy. The state of being on guard persists until the operative performs any actions. An enemy ends an action within control range of the operative and no guard functions are taken in response. The order is changed or the next turning point begins. On guard used to allow for a sort of early overwatch in the prior rules. It does a similar thing now. The effect can be triggered after an enemy performs an action. Any enemy. Any action. Even ones out of sight. The guarding operative can then choose to use a fight or shoot action for free as an out of activation action. They're also clear that if there is an action that can occur that is considered to be a fight or shoot action, they can take that instead of the universal versions. I'm sure the dual pistol toting specialists are mildly happy with this. And to be clear, there is no reduction to the hit stat when utilizing this guard attack. Guard also provides a version of a shoot action that can be taken as an enemy gets within control range of the guarding unit with some slight downsides. The only target the guarding operative can choose to attack is the one that entered its control range. The shots fired will be at a minus one hit stat. I imagine some teams will have decent options for preventing hit stat reduction. After this attack is made for the rest of the interrupted enemy's activation, this operative that took this point blank shot option will not be able to retaliate in a fight. A bit of a risk for both sides, honestly. Imagine charging a hit stat modifier ignoring Meltagun. Hatchway fight is another close quarters action that can be taken in the Gallo Dark. It is a means to prevent door blocking shenanigans. The operative that uses this ability triggers a standard fight sequence to occur. Their base must be touching an open hatchway area. They can target an enemy operative that is within two inches of an open hatchway. This target must be on the opposing side of the hatch wall. Both operatives will treat each other as being in their control range for the action. This cannot be taken if the active operative is already in control range of another enemy and, as a reminder, assistance that can be gained in the heat of melee combat
can only come from allies within the control range of the enemy that is part of the fight action. For the most part, that would mean this action can potentially be unassisted, unless there is already another operative on the other side of the wall in combat with the target, or maybe an operative with a bigger than normal control range is involved. Pretty much most of the Galadark functions are the same, barring some more lethality from the condensed environment rules. Lastly, Beta Decima was kind of the new kid on the block for Kill Team. It provided massive benefits for flying or highly vertically mobile teams and gave incredible benefits to teams with the rare anti-obscuring rules. Much of this has been worked through in a few rebalancing data slates and much of those changes persist here with the new benefits for Vantage being applied. Terrain-wise, all Vantage floors are accessible, allowing operatives to pass through them from below at the cost of an inch. Most of the kill zone floor touching components are considered heavy. Topside ramparts are for the most part considered light. Components in the middle of that big piece of terrain is considered exposed and insignificant. Most of the arena flavor comes from the hazardous area rules. The game board used will have large zones marked as hazardous. Operative bases cannot touch this area, and the zone overall prevents targeting between operatives on the kill zone floor if more than four inches is measured across this area. A key change here is that it seems that they removed receiving damage for entering the hazardous area. Claiming that operative bases cannot enter it seems to imply that even if you have the ability to forcibly reposition enemy units, you cannot push them into this zone. It should also be said that for the gantry terrain pieces, the whole area beneath the vantage floor between the heavy support beams is considered part of the overall footprint of the terrain piece. This area can prevent targeting from operatives on vantage points in this map type. The target blocking rule is reciprocal. If the vantaged operative cannot target due to this, neither can the operative below. Footprints are ignored if the enemy is within the footprint area, and the area below the vantaged operative is also ignored. A benefit to this zone is that the equipment chosen that can be placed in the kill zone can also be placed on vantage, even if prior they were stated to only be able to be set up on the kill zone floor. Beta Decima has been trying hard to limit the extreme power some rules originally brought to it with line of sight. Flight and hypermobility will still most likely be king, but when I originally saw the shift from the hazardous zone being considered obscuring to being considered fully blocking, I felt that the oppressive nature of some teams would finally be brought to heel. All in all, each of these specific arenas will provide something very special to every game played in both matched and casual. And it's great that they were all brought up to the standard of the new rules. And this, all laid out before you, is the new updated rules for Kill Team. I know they released an approved ops alongside of this, that's gonna be its own video as that will most likely change in big drastic ways over time. I've heard it said that this is viewed more as a Kill Team 2.5 than a full 3.0 revamp. I'm kind of on that same page, which is good. This means returning players will have to make minimal adjustments to their understanding of the game, and new players will find less loopholes and gray rules writing between them and their first attempt at playing a match. And with the rules that I've seen from some of the teams in play now, beyond this collection of core rules, there are some big swings in how unit interactions and abilities work that seem to bring up the power of lesser used operatives. Just an overall good shift at least for the core system. We have still yet to see the true form of the new classified and declassified structure, a key element for the competitive scene. As well, the promise of continued patching for teams even after being declassified, so casual play can still go on with those teams. I truly hope for the best there. With all that said, what do you think of the rules? Did anything stand out to you as maybe a bigger shift than people might be expecting? Did we go over anything that maybe seemed a little iffy in prior rules that now feels a lot more clear to you? Let us know in the comments below, and if you want to continue the conversation or maybe regale us with tales of victory or share in the woes of defeat, there is a Discord linked below. We'll be happy to have you. As always, likes for the like god and subscribes for the subscribe throne. I am Kimmerix, and I'll see you in the next one.